My uh, talk is Better Living Through SBT. I'm Luke Amdor. Um, I've been in the Scala community for a while. Um, I work at Bano. Um, we have, we're like one of the, like, the Scala communities I kind of consider as a hidden secret. Um, we have about 50, 60 developers. Half of them do Scala full time. Um, we, I think we train a lot of interns and um, just bring them up. We've, I, I think we're a big Scala breeding ground. Um, um, but as we've grown, um, we've got three projects. We got a web, a mobile, and a kernel. They're very large. And <laughs> we've been doing this for about three, four years. And we've just kind of become a large number of projects. And a large number of libraries and a large number of deployables. So um, it gets rather chaotic. Um, we keep separate repositories for all of our projects as well, too. We don't kind of shy away from the multi-module stuff. Um, we only have like very few multi-module projects. I find it's easier for code reuse and binary compatibility if they're all separate repositories and released separately. So it's worked out really, really well for us. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about is SBT. So we've embraced SBT. Um, SBT has been pretty awesome. Most of my problems with SBT aren't with SBT itself. It's either with the library maintainers or Ivy. Um, so what I wanted to, to show is like, we're maintaining all these different projects, but well, here's some of the tips and tricks that we've used with SBT to make it really kind of manageable. Um, as the projects grow, uh, it becomes like a lot of pain. Uh, we set up becomes painful on all these different projects. Activators kind of helped with that, um, but it just seems like too much overhead for such a simple project. Clashing dependencies becomes painful. It's, it's a problem no matter where you are. Maintenance becomes painful. Basically, uh, variance itself is painful between all the different projects. So. I've been a, before I was a Scala programmer, I was a, a Java programmer. And back in those days, um, we used Maven. And Maven actually, besides all, all of its warts, had some pretty good common principles that I think we've kind of need to stick to. Um, one of them was um, a parent POM XML. So in Maven, you have this project object model, right? It's an XML file. Um, but it was customary to keep that all um, and within an organization. And, to maintain dependencies and like kind of restrict things a little bit to keep a parent POM XML for the organization. Um, some bigger examples of this are like the Apache project POM. All Apache projects that are built by Maven have to <coughs> adhere to this parent POM. And it, by doing that and restricting things, they're, they're able to make things much more controllable and manageable. Um, so what we did is we <laughs> kind of did follow the same principle. We have a, a Bano SBT plugin um, that works out really well. It's, it's the SBT plugin. Standardized settings for a lot of different things. Um, it's a bag of tricks, and it's not really a conventional plugin sense. Um, it's just basically a dependency that your project can just depend on in a way. Um, it depends on some other plugins. So some things that you might not know is that a plugin can depend on other plugins, and it just brings those automatically into your scope. So um, instead of having all of our different projects depend on SBT assembly, ether deploy, revolver, or release, this SBT Banos SBT plugin just depends on those, and they just get them for free. Really cool trick. Um, it's kind of in SBT 13. Before SBT 13, it was a little bit of a pain uh, due to some of the cross versioning, but in 13, it works out really, really well. Um, so, this is what <laughs> all of our build, uh, build SBTs really look like. It's just importing that, setting the names, setting the default dependencies, um, adding a band of dependencies. I'll kind of talk about that, library dependencies, and then just X2 settings. It's really simple. All of our projects are about this length. Um, we don't have a huge project. At, build X Scala file or anything like that. Um, so some of the things we do for global settings. Um, so I'll cut, is this is what all, all of our settings basically follow the same type of pattern where I'll kind of talk a little bit more about this, where it's just object settings equals all these different settings. Um, setting up the basic dependency, like the basic information for all of our banner projects, versioning, <coughs> Scala versioning. Um, we never really package our source of documentation. I wish this was the default um, myself. Um, some of the basic Java options that, I mean, we're running on modern hardware, might as well use this. Um, SBT Revolver, how many of you use SBT Revolver? All right, more of you should be. If you're running anything, it's amazing for forking off processes. Otherwise, running in within your main thread on your SBT, it, pain, pain, a lot of restarts. Um, Another thing we do is um, write a CI task um, that does a publish, teen, te publish test and clean. This is like w really kind of a, a weird SBT task syntax, but um, there's no, this is kind of like the same thing that the Maven publish does. Um, I just, we just kind of cobbled it together. Pretty easy there. 
Um, this is, most of your projects should have like separate snapshot repositories and release repositories, pretty basic. Um, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about our, how we do dependencies, um, but standard dependencies across all the projects are really, really good. Um, Joda should be just default and SLF or J and just kicking all the other logging frameworks to the road. Um, we also use logback, which is really pretty good too. Um, compile settings, uh, this kind of came to use to get larger and larger and changes as we, this is probably like one of the more debated parts within our organization as we flip and flag like different language features um, or warnings. Um, when I originally turned this on, I had about six, seven warnings. So my advice is to turn on as many warnings as you can and then just scale back as much as, as you can. Um, yeah, it, it, it becomes a lot of noise. Otherwise, um, another good thing that we do is we hand roll a lot of our subs and mocks. So we don't re want reflective calls within our Scala, main Scala code, but in our test Scala code, it's, it's perfectly normal. So uh, doing that is really pretty handy. Um, I'll kind of talk about a release here too um, on Ivy. Um, so that's basically all of our standard settings. Uh, the way we do dependencies, so not all projects are going to depend on Aka. Not all projects are going to depend on Spray. So what we do is we, we have these things we call uh, dependency sets. Uh, so I already kind of talked about the common dependencies, but we also do like Aka settings, spray, cert, client service sets, caching, Scala Z. We have a whole bunch of these um, because remembering all the different organization names and artifact IDs just sucks. So just remember, I just need to work, depend on spray, which is a one line in our settings. And all of them follow the same pattern uh, where we have a version and we just add in the library dependencies in. Um, and then if a project really needs a newer version of something, then what's the default? They can easily do that. Um, and you can also depend on a Scala versioning too if you really have different Scala versions. Um, panel IV settings, how many of you know what all the things in IV XML you can do? The guy who wrote one book. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> panel IV, uh, the, the IV is, uh, the XML is, it's disgusting in a way. Um, so what we have, um, we just made helper functions that um, I need, I and mean, we need to actually open source this plugin more, um, where we, instead of having to remember all the overrides and the excludes and everything like that, we just have, we call functions and they just transform the XML, which is really pretty slick. Um, we, and even though uh, we have all that, we still occasionally need to clean out the IV cache and local, so we actually made it just a task to do that. Um, it's really pretty handy. All right. Got to keep on track here. Uh, versioning and releases, um, this is kind of one of the bigger parts of, that our plugin provides for us. Um, and within a large organization, that, especially with us, that we work in banking, uh, compliance is very, very important to be able to, to have developer happiness and sane artifacts that can be fully uh, replicated later is pretty important to us. Um, so we want fluidity during development and we want reproducible artifacts. So how can we really do that? Um, what we ended up doing is we, we have this little um, method we call add banner dependency and you give it an artifact ID. And it keeps a set of banner dependencies along that build. And we add them into the library dependencies, keeps its own little set of those, or seek of those. Um, and just more stuff on top of that. But what it really does is it um, uses snapshots when developing and then stable releases when it's actually being released. Um, we, uh, we keep a setting key for a released version of something, um, and then we actually put it into, so if we're building a snapshot, we build a snapshot version, otherwise it's released, <coughs> but we um, keep all those version settings in a different versions file. So um, if you guys use um, SBT release, it keeps all the, the your actual project version in a version.sbt, um, but all of the banal artifacts that we have, we keep in this versions thing. Um, and so, when we do a release, it updates all of those to be the newest releases, updates the version to be the newest release, whereas we use Nexus for our internal proxy. Uh, so it sets all those things, commits all those things, does a clean test, commits tags, and then pushes all that up and puts everything back to snapshot. Works out really pretty slick. So when we, when we have that set release, all of those versions are set to their latest releases and everything just kind of works. And then if we have to come back, we can always rebuild and it pulls in the actual set releases. Um, and this is one of our build pipelines. So 
um, as we build through things, all of these things go through that same release process and the way that all of our dependencies kind of work down. Um, it works out pretty, pretty slick for us. Um, so one of the things is that most of the time when we're developing, binary snapshots are okay. So this is a, like a surefire way to speed up all of your compile times, is depending on actual binary artifacts. Um, it's kind of, it's sort of sad to me in that um, downloading an artifact over network is faster than compilation at times, um, but it beats it pretty easily. If you can actually have Jenkins automatically building snapshots and pulling the snapshots down, um, it's, it's greatly, enhanced, uh, greatly speeds up our development process instead of building all these things from source. Um, but yeah, most of the time when you're developing, the binary snapshots are okay, um, but when you're doing things across project dependencies, um, you need a, like a faster project development mode than doing the old publish local, compile in the other project, publish local, compile project. How many of you have done that? Well, yeah, it's, it's pain. Um, so what, you can, what we do is we can, we symlink the external band of dependency underneath their project. And uh, there was a post from uh, Nathan, wow, that was three years ago, two, three years ago, about loading external projects in SBT. And it was mostly about like using Git and maybe some project, um, like uh, project refs outside of your project for that, like actual paths. Um, but we, we automatically just pick up the symlinks underneath of there and turn them into external project references. So that add bound dependency kind of names all those different things, right? And if there's a symlink underneath that matches one of those, it just, just kind of adds a project ref dependency on it outside of that. It, just, it works pretty, pretty well. So um, we have a banner utils underneath this guy. It just automatically picks it up as a project and cross compiles against both of them. We do run into some problems occasionally with, so when you do this, inside of this project, it'll use this guy's pl plugin versions and his plugin dependencies. Um, and banner utils will not know anything about, it will not pick up any banner utils plugins, which doesn't really happen that often, but we have a couple different things that we sometimes run into that. Uh, oh, I, I, that's a bad code there. But this is all the code is to do it, just picking up the sim links and making the project refs. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, this is what our builds become. Uh, becomes AWS utils and then settings, add abandoned dependencies. So if, as your organizations grow and grow and grow, I strongly urge you guys to kind of go down this route of standardizing and making your, all of your builds coherent and stable. So um, that's all I really have. I got two minutes. I made it finish under two minutes. So I got a question? Is any of this open source yet? No, not yet. So that's, it's, it's, the hard part was like trying to trick, figure out like, I don't want to, like, we also have settings in there for like our Nexus repository, right? So I want to kind of pull that out a little bit more, but I think I, I'm more than open to being able to make this all open source. It would be really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, we, we started this ban SPT plugin back in the SPT seven days, um, and it's just kind of grown and grown and grown with us. Um, and yeah, it's just like a Katamari, it just keeps on growing and adding things to it, so. Um, any other questions? Uh, we don't. So when we do a release cut, cut of tag, that it's using the, the releases that are underneath the versions band of dependencies.sbt, right? And those are already published up to Nexus and everything like that. It'll only use those. It will not use snapshots. So any other questions? Yeah. We generated that from Jenkins. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the question was when we actually do a release, cut a release, um, what determines what the version number is? Um, we just query Nexus and figure out what the latest version is and just increment. We, yeah, we use semantic versioning on that. It's really easy with the SVD version to say bump minor and go along your day. So, any other questions? Yeah. No, it's resident in each repository. It's committed alongside with the code for this repository. So, so they're all iterated independently? Mm hmm. Yeah. It'll, I mean, when it does, it goes to that whole build pipeline, it just, it just picks up the oldest one. So. Anyways, thank you guys.